I'll be covering all the different aspects. I'm going to give you a, a direct line to essentially three different things which you'll find useful with Jalview, and then give you some pointers for more information. And just to give you a little bit of an overview, here are the topics. Firstly, I'll give you an example of an analysis that's been done in Jalview and to mention a little bit about the figure generation. We're not going to talk about figure generation, but the reason Jalview is so popular is because it was one of the first tools that allowed you to do some analysis of sequences along with the, the structure and do some evolutionary analysis to do phylogenetic trees and then produce a figure for publication. And that was in 1997 and Jalview is still going. It's a shockingly, I can see some people shaking. Yeah, I mean, oddly enough, some code still exists after 30 years. Um, here's a little bit of a pop quiz. Firstly, who knows what a faster file is? You need to, this is audience participation. Uh, well, it is it is very much about sequences. It's not just amino acids, and it can also show uh, sequences which have been aligned as well. So it's one of the simplest bioinformatics file formats that isn't an Excel spreadsheet. Or... So that, for Jalview, allows you to import sequences and to also export alignments. And this is just a, a reveal of a of Jalview's user interface. So you can see here there are sequences, there's some red bars, and those correspond actually to these histograms here. So the next pop quiz, PDB. So that stands for Protein Data Bank. And this is one of the oldest uh, databases that's been used by both biologists and chemists, and it's used for storing all of the known molecular structures in biology and chemistry. So that looks like it's basically a series of atomic coordinates. It gives you 3D spatial positions of atoms. And for Jalview, that's a picture of a protein structure of an, or in another molecular structure. CSV. Oh, You've been there. Um, so Jalvi can export CSVs, but the CSV is here for the histogram. So the one of the things you might need to do is to take data from a web page or take data from a program that's done some calculations about sequences and any other kinds of biological information. You might need to export it, and CSV is one of the simplest ones to export as. And you can import that into Excel again or R. Finally, or penultimately, Newick. This one's quite hard. So can you see the structure? Probably none of you at the back can see. So this is a series of, of brackets, and then there are the names of proteins, and then there's a number next to them. Absolutely, yeah. So this was the pretty much the first file format that was developed for sharing evolutionary information about genes. And uh, it happened over lunch in a cafe in Newark in New Hampshire. So this is also called the New Hampshire format. These are all crazy anecdotes from people in the early 80s who were working out all these things on computers. So for Jalview, we can show it. there's a built-in trivia which processes these files, and you can export the Newark files as well if you need to take it to another program. Finally, GFF. So that is also called generic feature format or gene feature format. And we use it in Jalview to import and export annotation from the public databases, which tell us about the functional regions of proteins and genes. So in this case, this is a positive selection analysis, which I did some years ago now, where I took a protein sequence alignment and I actually converted it into 
a series of codons, so the codon alignment, and then performed a phylogenetic analysis to get the, this tree. And based on the tree and the protein sequence alignment, I used a program called PAML, which does a statistical analysis of the variation of the nucleotides in order to determine whether these long branches of the tree correspond to particular columns of the multiple sequence alignment. So that's what the histograms here represent. So the panel sites here are the regions which are varying um, significantly according to the evolutionary uh, relationship between these sequences. And that suggests that there has been some specialization. So evolution has happened to adapt to these genes to do something particular. Does anybody want to hazard a guess as to what this terrible picture of a protein structure represents? Well, it's a mix of alpha and was, I think we started by some of the data sheets. Exactly what protein it is, couldn't you, you definitely recognise the ribbon representation, which is the curly bits and the, the arrow bits, the stripes. So that's that's the alpha helices and beta sheets. So this is uh, an, in, an, an antigen recogni recognition complex. So this is the... Um, it's the LDA or there's also the LDB antigen receptors, which is part of the, the histogram or the MHC signaling chain. And the, the red regions in the alignment correspond to the red and orange regions in the structure. And that's showing that there's adaptation according to recognition of antigens. So each of these different sequences have been tuned to recognize different molecules binding there. And this is how some parts of our immune system recognize molecules and then signal a response. Okay, so that's almost all of the audience participation over. A little bit about Jalview. The name comes from the fact it's it was originally developed as an alignment viewer, but it does quite a bit more than that. It allows you to edit alignments and so on. I, again, I won't be talking too much about that, but the key idea is that you have this alignment view, you also have a tree viewer and you have a structure viewer. It's available at this website, www.jalvi.org. If you haven't browsed to it at some point, you can download it and run it. There's also a JavaScript version, which will probably run on your mobile phone, but might be a bit little. It's okay on an iPad. Uh, we're just developing it at the moment. So if you do need to use it and you haven't got a computer available, you might be able to just start fire it up in your browser. It's free software. It's been GPL licensed since the beginning. What that means is that uh, we develop it in the open. All the new features are public, re publicly released as soon as we hit enter on our keyboards, pretty much. And it's been developed by the Barton Group. It's Jeff Barton. Who does Jeff get involved with this masters at all? We well, haven't worked that out yet. Um, I don't think he is. But James Abbott will give some lectures on um, coding. Um, oh yes, like yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm part of Jeff Button's bioinformatics group, which consists of the Jalview team, some people doing actual protein structure and sequence research, and then there's also a data analysis group. And James Abbott is part of that group; he leads that. Okay, it's written in Java. That's where the J comes from. That's another story. Feel free to say hello to me about that later. The basic idea is that it visualizes lots of different types of bioinformatics data files and allows them to be, allows all the, the information in those data files to be viewed in, in context. So you can see what's going on from the protein sequence level. You can see the information from the database about the functional information in the context of the sequence and the alignments and the, the evolutionary history and also map that onto 3D structure. In terms of the kind of um, classical, well, we'll say con contemporary um, sequencing and gene analysis investigation, you may hear about over the next few months. Jalview gets used right at the end of the chain, so to understand why there are variants, why there is variance at the DNA or the protein sequence level. But there's a whole chain of processing that happens before that, and that's something that James Abbott actually specializes in. So. This is when you're working with next generation sequence data, where the, the data comes off the machine, actually in something called FastQ, which is like FastA, 
and then gets processed and eventually gets marked up as positions on a genome which have been observed to vary. And this is what you do when you're calling SNPs, for instance, for single nucleotide polymorphisms. I won't ask you to launch Jalview, but you can if you wish, and follow along. When you launch Jalview, what you get is an example project which shows you a few different things. So you can, of course, close this off and you can configure it so it doesn't automatically open. But what you see are demonstrations of this 3D structure, tree viewer, and multiple alignment visualization. The alignment visualization is a little more sophisticated than it first seems. So you have the, if I move my, my mouse across, oh, it's just waking up. So here are the, the names of the sequences, and then you have the amino acids scrolling along, just in, in lines along, along the display. And this is actually a multiple sequence alignment. So the columns represent positions in each of these different proteins, which have been considered um, maximally similar according to uh, a computational analysis that's using a multiple sequence alignment program. And that's, that's purely a mathematical optimization. There's a model of how amino acids vary and essentially the program shuffles the amino acids around until it maximizes the score for the, the, common, the common columns. Now here I've got this thing up here. So there are a few different tabs. You can have different visualizations of the same sequence alignment. And that means that you can show different types of information on the alignment, on the same alignment. Jalvi also has some built-in analysis routines that produce scores at the bottom of the alignment that tell you whether a column of the alignment, in this case, you have conservation, which is amino acid physical chemical co property conservation. So you know that some amino acids have got similar chemical properties, others have got very different. Some of them have got lots of hydrophobic, greasy side chains, and others are hydrophilic, and they're all, and in proteins, they're found on the surface of the protein rather than inside. So that's what that corresponds to. Again, this is a whistle-stop tour, I'll not go into detail. The tree viewer works with the alignment by linking the rows in the alignment view with the with the nodes of the tree. So here I can click in the tree viewer and that will subdivide the alignment according to the topology of the tree. And in this case, into three different groups. And also you can select the tips. You can select sequences according to the tree. Now the structure works a little bit differently. So if you move, move the mouse over the structure, the position in the alignment corresponding to the positions in the structure under the mouse will get highlighted. And you can also propagate the coloring from the sequence alignment to the structure. So that allows you to calculate a multiple sequence alignment to get the conservation for a gene and then map that conservation onto the structure automatically. That's, that's kind of Jalvi's reason for existence. So there are a few things you need to remember when you're using Jalvi. Firstly, so you can select regions of Jalvi by just clicking and dragging across the alignment view. And then when you do an operation like um, run one of the programs that Jalvi connects with or compute a tree, Jalvi uses that selection to do the analysis. It's a little bit like you, know, you, you select a region then do something with it. That's the metaphor. If you want to work on the whole alignment, just remember to press escape. That just clears the current selection. It's pretty standard in most programs. Jalvi has a thing called projects, which you can find when you look at the save box and scroll right to the bottom of the format option, uh, drop down menu. Um, these are all Mac oriented, but this same thing appears in Windows. So the Jalview projects are called .jvps. They save everything that's in the, the Jalview session. So they save your trees, your, pretty, your PDB structures, your, the views of the structure, all the different multiple views of the multiple sequence alignments as well. So if you want to save all the data associated with the figure, save it as a project, and you can load it back in later, even if the new version of Jalvi has come out. There is an option called Close All under the Windows menu. You might find that very useful if you want to close the current set of windows you've got open in Jalvi. And um, 
particularly if you've got the example project loaded, which is a bunch of windows that you probably don't need. And finally, if you press F1, there's a built-in help. It's pretty extensive, so you can find more information there. Okay, ah, one reasonable amount of time. So the first thing I'm gonna do is walk you through retrieving a human gene from a database called Ensemble using Jalview's built-in client for the Ensemble database. And uh, this involves a few different steps. And it also benefits from the fact that Ensemble is a database that contains both assembled, primarily eukaryotic genomes. It also integrates data from other databases that give you information about population variation in the genome. So it gives you SNP sites from things like the, the I'm sure some of you have heard of the 1000 Genomes Project and the 10,000 Genomes, the 10,000 People Project. And they, Ensemble, provide the publicly accessible versions of these data. We start by going up to the top left corner of the Jalview desktop and going to the fetch sequences menu option. And that opens the database chooser. So this, this lists all the different databases that Jalview can access. And I'll tell you a bit more about those later. But for the moment, we're just gonna go to the Ensemble database. And you see there's a little two tool tip that pops up that tells you a bit more about the, del the database as well. The next thing that opens is a dialog box that asks you to enter an ID. And of course, none of you will have a favorite Ensemble ID in your head. These are just numbers with usually some letters like ENSG at the beginning of them. They're not very user friendly. You can usually find these IDs if you Google your protein of interest or your gene of interest. Ensemble also does understand some of the, the, the standard nomenclature for genes. So for instance, you can type in HOX1 and you'll get the HOX1 genes from a, a set of different organisms. So we, we've recoded some hard coded some model organisms that will that Jalview will retrieve for. But if you want a particular organism's gene, you need to look up its ID right now. We're, we're trying to make that better. That's what you get back from Ensemble is the locus, the, the contiguous stretch of genomic sequence where that gene is found. And you also get all the transcripts which are known to be uh, transcribed from those, from that locus. And the way Jalvi shows it to you as, is as an alignment. So at the top, you have the genome, the, the genomic sequence, so the locus. And you can see here there are these red rectangles highlighting particular bases. And those are features that have come from, from Ensemble to highlight positions where there are nucleotide variations. So these are again these SNPs, these, these population genetic information. And some of these SNPs have been classified according to whether they cause pathogenic diseases or some other kind of conditions. What comes below are all the transcripts and the transcripts have been shown aligned to the reference genome. And that just means you get actually a very boring alignment because all the columns are the same. You've got, in this case, the DNA rather than the RNA representation of the transcript. So you get T's rather than U's here. And you can see that the transcripts also inherit the single nucleotide and um, other poor Norfolk features, the red, the red lozenges. Uh, yep. The IDs, are they actually set up ensemble gene number, ensemble transcript number? For human, yeah, <laughs> but not for, not for no, the other organisms. <laughs> Uh, in, in principle, that's what it should be, but they they started out with a good plan and then they broke it. Yeah. So um, it, this is one of the problems with bioinformatics databases. Ensemble are Ensemble are rapidly expanding to take all of the other species that are being sequenced, and they keep changing what they do. Thankfully, they don't change the IDs once they've put them in the database. They just don't put them in, in any kind of rationale. Order. Yeah, right. it means it's quite computationally difficult to work out what's going on. 
and we it's one of the reasons why you'll notice Java is quite slow when it talks to Ensemble because it's having to do a lot of processing to work out do I have a transcript do I have a, a protein that comes out something you'll find useful is the overview window and that's from the view menu and uh, when you open the overview window what you may see by default is sort of mostly a, a gray a gray box inside the window and in fact what this is showing are all the hidden introns which Jalview has excluded from this this alignment display so you can toggle how the overview window works so you can enable or dis disable this thing of showing the hidden regions so you just see exactly what you see in the alignment view but you see the whole extent of the alignment so these are actually I think this locus is is 55,000 bases long I think so, 55 kilobases. And um, the protein is only 300 amino acids. So it's only a small section of, of the actual nucleotide data that's, that's in this locus. And you can see here when you hide all of the hidden regions, you can see that there are these rather colorful sequences. So the sequences are also colored by the distinct exons. And they're just given a random color but you can see that there are multiple exons that are involved in this gene. Okay. Now, have I just put the same slide in twice there? I think I might have done. There we go. So the next thing is to drop down from the calculate menu to the get cross references option and then select Uniprot. So this is another database that Jalview can talk to. And when you do this, Jalview goes and retrieves the protein products for the gene that you're looking at, and then trims down the transcripts to just show the coding sequences for the transcripts corresponding with the protein products. So this is a slightly different view of the alignment then uh, of, of an alignment that you've already seen with Jalview because these are actually two alignment windows stacked on top of each other and if I I, I won't open out Jalview to demo that quite yet but um, when you scroll the alignment horizontally in one view the other one keeps keeps track as well and if you select sequences in one view the sequences are selected in the other so just a little Bit of information about the the variant features the, these red lozenges so this is a zoom in of the protein sequence alignment that's come from Uniprot and this alignment actually corresponds to the genome alignment so all Javi has done is looked at how the transcripts are aligned to the reference gene and recopied well moved the amino acid the amino acids that correspond to each codon in the, the CDS alignment to, re, to construct the protein alignment. And it's also propagated the single nucleotide polymorphisms and in some cases the, the other polymorphisms to as uh, amino acid coding code changes. So you can see here there's a mutation due to a SNP, a non-synonymous variant which mutates a cysteine to an arginine. And of course, in some cases, that change may result in the protein not having a function anymore or not performing the function it's intending. So you can find more information about what Ensemble tells you about that variant by going into some into another dialogue in Jalview called the Feature Settings dialog. And that's from the View menu. So this dialog shows the, the, the positional annotations, these features on the, on the sequences, as a list of different types. So there are a number of different variants which Ensemble gives you. One of them is non-synonymous variant, and other ones are stop-gained, so the gene doesn't actually get fully expressed. Uh, synonymous variant, there was a base change, but there's no change at the amino, uh, the amino acid level, but that could mean that there's a change in regulation or the RNA that the actual expression of the protein might be affected. And then of course there's exon as well. So you can hide and show these, you can give them different colors. Jalby just gives them all 
a red color, except for the exon, which it colors according to the exon number. So the next thing you might want to do is view the structure for these proteins. And this is, again, intentionally dead easy. That's the aim with Jalvi. So the, the essential operation is you select some sequences that you want to view the structure for. And currently, this only really works well for protein. And then you right click to bring up a pop up menu and select the 3D structure option from the pop up menu. And that gives you a dialogue after Jalvi goes and talks to the PDB to find out which protein structures are available for the, for the sequences you're looking at. And Jalvi tries to guess which structure is best for each sequence. So you might possibly have heard about um, that you can have different ways of looking at 3D structure. And some ways are more accurate than others. So there's a quality score, essentially, that's given for each one of these structures. But there might be other reasons why you want to pick a different structure, like it's bound to a particular drug. And there may be different structures for different drugs bound to the same, the same molecule that you then want to compare. So don't, don't always take what Jalvi suggests, but it's a good guide to start with. So you can pick a structure and then hit new view. And then with any luck, what you should see is a structure view for your gene. Now, due to a, uh, an interesting feature of Jalview, it tends to color the structures green to begin with because it adds another feature to the display which gives you information about the positions in the structure that correspond to the positions in the amino acid sequence. But you can disable that using the feature settings menu. So that's pretty much the first thing you should do. But here you can also see that there are a few red spots where you've got the single nucleotide polymorphisms highlighted on the structure. So we'll do a little bit more of this. The first thing is to go and disable this, this ResNum feature so it, nothing is green anymore. The other thing I could have done was click and dragged it to the bottom and that would have meant that it was sitting under all the other colors and so you couldn't see it. And you can actually change transparency of the features to overlay the different types of features to see where you've got multiple features appearing at one point. But this is a bit confusing, particularly when colors mix together and look like something else. And also if you're red, green colorblind, for instance, or have any other color issues. The next thing is to click in the configuration option. And what this allows you to do is filter the variants according to their predicted pathogenicity. So you get a fairly fearsome dialog box that appears when you click in the feed, in, in the, uh, the attribute option. But uh, essentially what this allows you to do is to change the way Jalview colors the feature. So instead of a simple color, I could pick the, the, the by text of option, which is gonna use the, the text of the attribute, which is, could be the name of a domain, for instance, in order to color the feature. Um, or I can do filtering. So here, instead of filtering on label, I pick from the drop-down menu the clinical significance attribute, which comes from Ensemble. And that actually comes from um, ClinVar, I believe, originally, which you may hear about later. And then I can type in pathogenic to only show me the pathogenic variants overlaid on the structure. So if I do that, I see far fewer variants and then I can mouse around the structure, hover the mouse over the bits of structure, and what I'll get is a little tooltip tool that will tell me the position in the structure, but also the, jal the, the view in Jalview will scroll to highlight the position in the sequence that corresponds to this. And that's, okay. yep. Yeah. I assume that the 3D view is all the sound of you know, rotate, kelp, and yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. The, the 3D view is, is one of the odd things that's standardized, but most of these viewers all work the same way. They're not quite like, um, like a first person shooter type thing, like a, a video game. They have a very slightly different approach, but if you've used any, any uh, 3D graphing software, they all use the same thing. So they call, they call it a virtual hyperball. And so you, you have this 
spatial ball that you can move around to rotate the scene. So you click and push forwards and your, your scene rotates like this. But the best thing to do is to just almost like randomly click and play around until you get used to how to move things around. Some viewers are, are even better, so you can just double click on a point and they zoom in to show you exactly that, that bit of the structure. That's an entirely different talk, however. So you can get more information about a feature by right clicking over it. Java gives you a couple of menu options then. One of them is link, and that can take you to the web page for the database where that feature originated. So here, these are all databases. Uh, these, these features were all available in DBSNP. And uh, that's also pro provided by Ensemble. So here you can open the web page in Ensemble that gives you more information. So that's giving you information at the, at the genome level. But if you want to get information at the protein level, you should also have a look at the feature details option, which will give you what Jalview has done to the feature in the translation. So in the feature details window, you just get the, the description, the IDs as well, and also things like the clinical significance field, so whether it was pathogenic or not. If you look at um, data sets like the, the thousand humans data set, they now have about um, 150 different attributes that they ship with each variant. So things like whether this has been it's come out as being uh, important for cancer prognosis or these kind of things. So there's actually quite a problem in managing all the data that you can get from these databases in simple table views like Java. So I've been talking for about half an hour now. I'll just do a little bit of a recap. What I've done so far is talk to you about Java and taking you through from the gene right through to looking at the 3D structure of a protein product and look at the variants in that structure. If you have a look at that gene, you'll find that there are some, some particular medical conditions that are related to those variants. Some of them are very serious, some of them are lethal, some of them are mildly serious. The 3D structure helps, but you often have to be a chemist or like a structural biochemist to really know what's going on. But there's enough information usually from the databases to tell you whether where the business end of the protein is. So you can often work out, oh, there's a variant here. It's near the active site. It might mean there's something happening or there's a ligand that binds that might be important therapeutically. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is the databases that Java can access in a little bit more detail. And then I'll talk about using the Uniprot database to not quite do the same thing, but to come from the other end where you select a set of proteins and analyze them together. And that involves creating an alignment and uh, using some other obvious features. So Uniprot is the modern name for a database that grew out of a, a project by, I think, one guy called Amos Bayrock. And, um, People who were looking at proteins realized they had to share all their knowledge anyway. But uh, there was a database called SwissProt, which was pretty much one guy single-handedly going through all the protein sequences, reading papers and annotating the regions of sequences so that people would look up quite quickly based on the database what a protein was doing. And also, importantly, he was looking at the experimentally characterized information about the protein. These days, you find that almost every protein that's known is in Uniprot, but some of those proteins have not been actually manually curated. They haven't been looked at, and somebody's read the paper and said, yes, this protein exists, and it does this. Others do, and they've got lots of information. The PDB, I've also mentioned, so the Protein Data Bank. The Protein Data Bank is a global effort. We, in Java, use the European site for the Protein Data Bank, which is hosted in Cambridge at the European Bioinformatics Institute. They actually talk with the PDB quite closely. Uh, sorry, Uniprot talk with the PDB quite closely. Uniprot is a European and Swiss and Europe uh, and I think South African effort. Is it, is it PDB Europe because it's just hosted in Europe or it's focused on European? It's because it's hosted in Europe. 
uh, there are PDBJ and PDB.RCSB.org, which is the, the US one. And I think there is a there is a PDB mirror. There was a PDB mirror in Australia, but they use PDBJ now because the internet connection is fast enough. So there's quite a lot of data processing that goes on at the other end of getting data into these databases. So it's it's good to have multiple sites working on this. So researchers in each different continent can talk directly with some people in the same time zone. But that actually matters a fair amount quite often. So what you get from the PDB are structures, these positional features, and you also get annotation tracks, which I'm not really going to mention today. But you, you'll, you'll see those in the JLB literature as well. There are two genomic databases. One of them is the European Nucleotide Archive. Now, the, the European Nucleotide Archive is also mirrored with GenBank, which is the US nucleotide database. They essentially show the same thing in very slightly different formats. So you, you may find that when you're running across this in the literature, you'll have a GenBank ID rather than a, an ENA ID. But if you give them to one, it will return the record in its own format. And the other one I've already mentioned is Ensemble. Now, the difference between European Nucleotide Archive and Ensemble is that ENA is a primary database source. So when somebody sequences raw data, uh, generates new sequence data from something observed in the wild, that data gets submitted to the European Nucleotide Archive. And then Ensemble take those gene sequences, those contigs of chromosomes, and assemble them into their own versions of, of, of complete genomes for organisms. So Ensemble have their own assembly of the human genome, which is roughly like the assembly that everybody else uses, but it might have a slightly different version number. So that's the reason why you don't get variants from the European Nucleotide Archive, but what you do get are protein products and coding sequences and complete stretches of cDNA. So you quite often find you've got whole viruses that have just been sequenced and put into ENA. The last two databases are alignment databases. So there's PFAM and RFAM, and these are domain databases which are developed by looking at, basically comparing all the sequences in proteins with each other, and looking to find out the regions which are in common. And there are some subtleties here, but essentially there's an, there's an automated tool that does this and produce clusters of, of sequences which are similar. And then and there are humans which go through all of these clusters and work out that, oh, there is a, there's a domain which has a particular sequence of amino acids. It has to have some amino acids conserved because those are functional for the domain. And then that gets all put into a model called a hidden Markov model. And then that can be used to search Uniprot to find all of the examples of that domain in the protein sequence database. And the similar thing for RNA. So with RNA, it's slightly different, uh, but the, the, the idea is the same. So there you get both seed alignments and then full alignments. And the seed alignments have been looked at by a human to work out that this, this domain family exists. And there's usually some annotation to say this column is important. And then you've got the full alignment, which is everything that matched it from Uniprom. Won't be doing anything with those today, but again, there's more information in the Jalby's manual. And all of these have got loads of training material on the website, on their own website. So you can spend quite a bit of time learning about all of these. Okay. So this is what you get when you query Uniprot from Jalview. So this is a dialog box that opens up when you select the Uniprot option from the database fetcher. And I've entered a query for the, well, pretty much the, the unique keyword in the name of the gene that we were looking at earlier, earlier which is homogenesate diox dioxygenase. There are very few genes with that, which actually work on this particular compound, uh, homogenesate. So and what I've also done is put in a structured query to limit the set of results returned from Uniprot to just genes which are found in the bilateria. Does anybody know what those are? <laughs> there are loads of obscure, obscure classifications. So these are the, this is the animal kingdom 
which has uh, bilateral symmetry. So that's as opposed to uh, is it unitaria? No. Starfish. Starfish is not. No, yeah, that has rotational symmetry, so it's got round symmetry. So basically, it doesn't include worms and starfish. Yeah. And then we get into arguments about what class things are in. The other thing I've done is chucked in fungi because actually fungi are one of the most simple eukaryotes, which have many of the genes that we have as well, just, just to, to see whether there's anything interesting in there as well. I've also added in another term, reviewed colon yes, and what that does is limits the set of records returned to just those proteins that have been looked at by a human. So you, you know that the annotation is real. If you don't have that, you'll get a lot more gene sequences, a, a lot, lot more proteins. Some of those proteins may not exist, or if they do exist, they, they may have been annotated as being the same as this protein, but actually electronically. So it's a prediction that's been made about the annotation rather than actually somebody's looked at it and observed it and said, this is that domain. These have the access sites in the right place and the domain in the right place to perform this particular enzyme operation, which this gene is supposed to do. So I get 31 sequences selected them all, hit OK to retrieve them. Now in Java, you get a very colorful alignment, although depending on your color taste, you may not like it. It's sort of this uh, institutional mud green, and uh, I won't say the other words that it reminds me of. So Java kind of makes up it col its colors using the text. So if you have a sequence, uh, so if you have a feature with a particular name, it always generates the same color by default for it. But if, this, if the feature has a slightly different name, it creates a slightly different color. But that does mean sometimes very different features might have the same color. You can see that the sequences that have been returned are unaligned. So they, they, in the overview, you can see that some of them are longer than the others. Um, that some of them seem to have these green features which in this case indicate domains. So there's a particular class of domain, PFAM domain, which are observed on these proteins called VOCs. And if I moused over them in Jalview here, I get a little tooltip popped up to say this is a domain annotation and the name of the domain is VOC, that's in the label. And if I wanted to click on the, the configuration option here for the domain, I could change the coloring to color by label. So Domains with the same color will be shown. The uh, domains with the same name will be shown in the same color on the alignment. But because there are lots of other colors there, it's pretty confusing. So one thing I would first do is to disable almost all of the other features there and just focus on one type of annotation, just to show, to, just to look at that. Jalvi also has a thing called the optimize order button, and that reorders the features to make the shortest features sit on top of the longest features. And that just means you can more easily see all of the annotation at once. So, the next thing I'll do is run an alignment. The Jalview has access to a range of different alignment programs. I'm using Clustal O here, which is called Clustal Omega in the real world rather than the Jalview world. These alignment programs have got all different, um, have got different. Uh, capabilities. Some of them are best suited for some types of sequences. Clustal Omega probably isn't the best choice for this sequence set, but it is very fast. So if you're dealing with thousands of protein sequences, using Clustal Omega is a very good first step to produce an alignment. So if I do that, now because Jalview creates a new alignment window, the next thing I did in this particular screenshot was I then re-enabled the, the sequence feature annotation so I could see the positions of just the domain annotation overlaid on the alignment. So again, this is the overview window. The red box shows what's shown in the in the alignment, the main alignment window. And you can see that most of these sequences here have got it's green annotation corresponding to the VOC domain, and that's reasonably well aligned. Interestingly, there's a there's a histidine, the H is 
here. These all line up. And it turns out that those histidines have also got some annotation, which say they're part of the active site. So that's that's a good thing. It means your alignment's spot on, more or less. It should be doing this. Okay. There are a few things that you can go on and do here. So you can have a look at the features that are well aligned. You can take a look at domain labels. You can go and open up the structures for these. There are actually four structures for these um, for these sequences that I've got in this view. Two of them are human, one from rat, one from mouse. And one question you might ask is, given that you've done a query of Unicrot for homogenetizate and limited it to a particular set of uh, species, do all the genes that have come back from that query do the same thing? Are they all homogenetizate, one, two, dioxygenase enzymes, or are they doing something else? And you can do that with an alignment as well. So Jalview has a few other things it can do. One of them is it can shade the sequences according to how similar they are in the alignment. So in this, in this view, it's taking a while for the network to catch up. You can see that there are these blue regions, and those correspond to nearly identical amino acid regions in all of the different sequences in the alignment. And they've been aligned in the right place. You can also see there are gaps regions. Those are just minuses. You can also hide those in Java. But you can see that there are a fair few places where you don't get any color at all for the amino acid. And that's because it's different to everything else in the alignment. So these are non-conserved regions in those sequences. And if you look in the overview, some of you might be able to see right at the bottom, you can see that there is this sort of gold histogram. And that's showing you the amino acid conservation score for the alignment. And you can see that there are some really high scoring regions, but those are probably only stretches of five or six amino acids in the alignment. And then the rest has got much lower conservation. You would normally expect that if all the enzymes in this alignment were doing the same thing, they would be pretty well conserved. They would all have similar physical chemical property conservation scores. So this is a suggestion something else might be going on. So what you can do then is to calculate a phylogenetic tree. And you can do that by using the calculate menu. And there's, a, there's an option called calculate tree or PCA. You can open up that dialog. And then that calculates one of these dendrogram structures. And what I've then done is clicked in the tree to cut it into, into subtrees. And each of these subtrees has been colored differently. So the top one is colored blue. And there's this sort of yellowy one in the middle. There's a pale yellow one. And then there's a magenta color right at the bottom. That is also sort of randomly assigned. If you click the tree again, the, the colors get recomputed. The alignment will also get subdivided and colors assigned to the sequence IDs. If, when you do this yourself, you'll notice that the alignment is actually not ordered in the same way as the tree. And in fact, if I flip back to this view, this ordering doesn't really show the similar sequences lined up against each other. It's, it's actually the original ordering that came from Uniprot. So you can sort the alignment according to the tree, and that puts the most similar sequences next to each other in the rows of the alignment. And that allows you to more easily compare the differences between those sequences. And you can see that there are blocks of conservation. And there's a, there's a visual trick, which I won't, won't go into, but essentially you can see local conservation patterns once you've defined these groups on the tree. So that is kind of gel view in a very rapid um, tour. These, this is kind of the business end of gel view. There are lots of other things. What I've gone through is explaining how gel view can allow you to go from DNA right through to protein and 3D structure and look at transcripts. It provides you ways of coloring the sequences and coloring the features to highlight information about those features on those sequences as well. The features on Ensemble and Uniprot give you information about function. 
and also information about the population variation and also uh, observed cases of disruptions to those functions. Now, you should also bear in mind that some of those features might be predicted based on similar, situ similar genes in other organisms or based on some mouse models or something. They think it's probably the case, but they may not have actually observed those phenotypes. So you always have to check where the information is coming from in the databases. When you do alignments of proteins, you can understand how function might be conserved or different between those proteins. And Java allows you to view that conservation and produce trees. And when you calculate a tree and reorder your alignment, you can subdivide it to understand the maybe functional subgroups. You might also see that there are species divisions between the trees where you find that one set of species have one type of gene Another set of species have another type of gene. So they're more distantly related genes, which have functionally diversified. There are lots more places you can go to find out about Jalvi. The built-in help, there is a hefty PDF manual of about 100 pages, which includes worked exercises, if you'd like to go through them. That's usually what we do when we do our Jalvi training courses. And there are also YouTube videos which cover all of those exercises. So we've got, I think it's a bit more like 100 minutes worth of YouTube videos which you can take a look at to find out how to do all these things. So that's me. Thanks very much. I should just thank these people who are my partners in crime for Jalvin.